Well, hello, New City. I'm coming to you from my parents' basement, and I hope I'm looking at you. I hope you can see my full face and not just half of it. There are cameras over here and over there. There's a computer camera over here, a phone taped to something over here. And so please forgive me uh, if this is not the best videography ever. Uh, Javier is not here to have a beautiful recording space and to create uh, that great videography that you've seen during this Corona season. So I hope that these uh, next couple of weeks will be the last time I will have to preach into a video camera without seeing your face. And so please pray toward that end. That is our plan to uh, receive our certificate of occupancy in the next week, which will allow us to be on our property. And our hope, and please write this date down, is for July 19th to be the first time we gather outside, uh, socially distanced, uh, on the lawn of our new church building. And uh, so please plan on that. It will be a joy to all be together, even if we are masked and six feet apart. Uh, also, our hope and plan is for our grand opening service in our new building, uh, intentionally ready for this Corona season and for all of us to gather right back together inside is set for September 13th. That is the Sunday following Labor Day. So please be in prayer for this transition, for these dates, and be preparing yourself uh, to come back together with the body of Christ to worship in person. I can't wait to see you. And I can't wait to dive into our final two weeks here of our selections from Luke. And uh, it's a bit surprising that in our study of Luke, we did not yet cover Luke chapter 15. And so what a, uh, what a fitting ending to this series as we turn to this uh, beloved parable in Luke chapter 15, culminating in the parable of the father and his two sons. And so please uh, open your Bibles, join with me as we read together from Luke chapter 15, beginning in, in verse 1. We're going to read this entire chapter, so let's just uh, let God's word wash over us right now as we listen to him in these words from Holy Spirit. God, please open our eyes now. Open our eyes. God, speak to us because we are desperate to hear your words of truth and your words of life. Speak now, Lord, we, your children, listen, our great Father. Amen. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a, a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that, that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or that woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and, and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she... She calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. 
treat me as one of your hired servants. And, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and let us celebrate. For this, this my son was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing and he called to one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you. And I've never disobeyed your command, yet, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And that is the reading of God's word. You know, <clears throat> verse one, verse one is beautiful. Uh, verse one says now, uh, uh, the, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus. Think about how beautiful a statement that is. You know, that statement is, is in the progressive. That means they were continually drawing near to Jesus. And so what we have here is, is the upper and the middle and the lower class, white and blue collar, those with two comma and no comma incomes, that they all want to be close to Jesus. They all want to be close to Jesus. The one thing they had in common is that they did not measure up spiritually. That's what they had in common. Jesus was amazingly popular with them. Now, this was not beautiful to the spiritually serious Pharisees, you might say. They were confused and they were critical about this gathering around Jesus. It seems as if Psalm 1 came to their mind. And they, they thought to themselves, doesn't Jesus know Psalm 1 that says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of, of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers? You're not supposed to be around these people. We're supposed to distance ourselves from these people. It's not right for Jesus to eat with people who aren't right with God and to, and to make them think that they're all right. And it says as if Jesus responds. And I, I think this is the best summary of this parable that, that he's about to share. He says, guys, I'm just trying to show you the way that parties are done in heaven. I know how parties are done in heaven. I know because I'm from there. And, and I've been to the parties. And I've come here to show you how God does parties. And who God wants at his parties. I know because I've been there and I am him. And then he tells them this parable. This is the message he gives them in a parable. And for Jesus, you have to know that, that parables are both a work of art, and for Jesus, they were a weapon of warfare, you might say, because he drew people in and then pierced them. He, he, he pierced them with the time bomb of, of this truth that was unraveled in, in a story. Jesus used parables to get people to stop and to reconsider and, and to change their way of life or their way of thinking. And as we come to Luke 15 here, we have to know that this is not three separate parables. This is one parable with three parts. That's important to know here. This is, this is one parable. Jesus is basically saying, here's a story of, first of all, 100 sheep, and then 10 <laughs> coins, and then two brothers, moving from 100 to 10 to 2, because when I get to the end, what I'm really interested in is the one and only you. And 
Though Jesus was speaking to a listening crowd here, the dinner guests and the dinner critics, we are part of the crowd too. He's bringing this back to you. He's bringing this to me from 100 to 10 to 2 to you and to me. Well, the first part of this parable is a story where there's there's something not right with the flock. There was a loss of value. And at, at great cost, a, a man restored value to his lost sheep. And then when he found his lost sheep, he, he gathered his friends to celebrate, just like they celebrate in heaven. And then the second part of this story is a story where something's not right in the bank. There's a loss of value, and at great cost, this woman restores the value and, and brings the coin back into circulation, and, and she's celebrated with her friends just like they do in heaven. And the third story is, is a story about, about human beings. It's a human relationship where something's not right, just like in the previous two stories. Something's not right. There's a loss of value, and a man that is the father, at great cost to himself, restores the one who was lost and calls for a celebration. And so I'd like to look closer at the, at the third part of this parable, the story of the father with his two sons. This is the most popular and probably well-known of all of Jesus' parables. The artist Rembrandt obsessed over this, this parable. Several drawings and paintings were found of different aspects of, of this parable, uh, one of which he, he painted toward the end of his life, and it's known to be his greatest work. Many of you have probably seen that painting of, of the prodigal returning home, painted by Rembrandt. You know, most people, even, even those who have, have long left the church, they know about this parable. It's well known because... People are drawn into it. For the same reason I think Rembrandt was drawn into it. It, it has all the stuff that we experience in life um, and in our relationships that, that sometimes we don't quite know what to do with. Ambition. Temptation. Loss. Failure. Betrayal and jealousy and, and the shame that's underneath it all. And I think in this parable, it, it actually... It's dealing with shame that is, is a major theme, just like dealing with shame is a major theme throughout the Bible. How do we deal with the shame that is underneath our disobedience and separation from God? You know, this is also uh, a popular topic these days in our culture. People are talking a lot about shame, but I am persuaded that people misunderstand shame for the most part, when it's spoken of today, because oftentimes today when you hear people, particularly those outside of the church, talking about, about shame, it's presented as an impersonal, random, abstract, emotional reality that needs to be tamed, okay? Let me say that again. It's presented as, a, as an impersonal, random, abstract, emotional reality that needs to be tamed. Problem is you can't tame shame, can't tame it. You see, we can really only understand what we need to do with shame, and we can only fully understand the power of shame through a biblical lens. And this parable helps us to do that. You see, because in the Bible, what we what we learn is that shame is is powerful. Uh, shame is shame is. It's not only powerful, it's, it's personal. See, it's, it's, it's personal because with shame, there is a, there is a real being, uh, an, an evil personality known as the accuser. That is actually what's underneath the word, the title, the name Satan. The accuser who uses shame with the intent to destroy you and to destroy God's purposes through you. Shame is an incredibly powerful weapon used by, by the accuser. I think this is one of the things we see in Genesis chapter 3 before Adam and Eve ever sunk their teeth into the fruit. See, God made Adam and Eve with, with intrinsic worth. He vested them with the highest privilege and capacity 
uh, to be connected relationally, connected relationally to God and connected relationally to each other and to be creative vocationally. That is to be able to live their life and use their gifts and their personality and their skills, talents, mind, heart, and passions for God's glory and for God's reputation, to use those things in our work as we wake up every day to go out into his world. And so God created it was with the amazing ability and dignity of uh, being relationally connected and vocationally creative. That's so much of what life was meant to be. And even though, even though they had this special opportunity and calling from God, as we look back to Genesis chapter 3, even though they were so secure, so significant, so set up for great things, Satan the accuser used shame to lead them into irrational thinking and destructive behavior. Remember what he said? Basically, you're not enough. You're not enough, Adam and Eve. You don't have enough. Do this, do this. Eat of the fruit, and you'll be all you can be. You see, that was shame in a subtle way. That was shame, and it, it twisted everything the wrong way. And we've inherited that twistedness. And, and we see this, this twistedness in this parable. We see it, we see it in our daily life, don't we? Not only in this parable, we see it in our in our own experience. I mean, we see the fear, don't we, that arises out of shame, the insecurity that, that looks so different for each one of us. The ways in which we're we're so self-protective, the way that we use sharp and cutting words to hurt people, the way that we seek revenge, the, the ways that oftentimes we're we're too passive, we're paralyzed, we're, we enter into despair or greed, constantly comparing ourselves with others, the list goes on and on and on. You see, all this is from shame. Well, we need to understand, we've spoken about this before, is that shame is different from guilt. Guilt and shame are both realities in the Bible, to be sure, but they're different. They're two realities that both need to be dealt with, but they're different. You see, guilt says, I did something that's not right. Shame says, I, as a person, am not right. You see, guilt says, uh, I didn't do what I should have done. And shame says, you are not who you should be. Guilt says, I didn't do enough. Shame says, I am not enough. I don't have what it takes. I'm not worthy. You see, this was at the heart of the younger son's shame speech. You, you remember as he was developing his, his speech to go back to his father, at the heart of that speech was the proclamation that I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That was at the heart of the younger son's shame speech. And, and, and that's the language of shame. It's always tailor fit. The accuser is very good in his shame language and his shame lies. It's always tailor fit just for you just for me. You see, sometimes, and for some people, it might drive us into a destructive, frenzied pace of life. Uh, something's wrong with me, and the way that I'm going to fix this pain is if I will accomplish more. And so it sends us into a frenzy, frenzied pace. It drives us to despair. Something's wrong with me. I should do something. I should work. I should act. But, but, <clears throat> People are going to see me mess up. Uh, I don't want to be seen as a fool. I don't want to expose myself to failure, to criticism, and so I'll just stay here paralyzed. You see, both of those extremes can destroy your connectivity relationally and your creativity vocationally. It happens at work and at home. At work, at home, trying to produce enough to, pr to, to prove that you are somebody at work trying to produce, at home in your family, in your bank account trying to produce. Um, and this can lead to, again, a frenzied pace or, or paralysis for fear, fear of failure. Th this happens in our relationships. Um, shame says, don't you dare initiate forgiveness to that person you call a friend. Don't you dare initiate forgiveness to your 
spouse for fear. Or on the other extreme, you can't stop initiating. You over-initiate and overwhelm and exasperate. Some of us can't receive any criticism because of shame, and others absorb all of the criticism. Some of us can't take any affirmation because we don't think we're worthy of it. Others of us constantly crave any affirmation we can find. Shame is tricky. It, it, it always finds a way to destroy you and to destroy God's purposes through you. Uh, Dr. Kurt Thompson, who, who I've quoted before, psychiatrist, uh, a Christian, has written a wonderful book called The Soul of Shame. He, he writes about shame from a biblical perspective, and, and he, he goes on to show its, its spiritual roots. And he, he writes about, about shame, and he says this, and I, I quote, Shame is the primary tool evil leverages actively and intentionally to disintegrate, uh, to disintegrate individuals or communities, to disintegrate your personal story, to disintegrate your family, your marriage, your friendships, your church, your school community, to disintegrate your business or your political system, uh, to disintegrate any and all gifts of vocational vis vision and creativity that promote goodness, beauty, and joy in and for the lives of others. It's the, and shame's power lies in its subtlety and silence, and it will not be satisfied until all hell breaks loose. It will not be satisfied until all hell breaks loose. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying this because all hell broke loose in Jesus' story. All hell broke loose in this story in Luke chapter 15. The younger son's shame somehow convinced him that, that he wasn't enough. And the answer was the pleasure and the love that he'd find in a faraway land. Look, look how, it, how it, it destroyed his relational connectivity and his vocational uh, creativity. Look how it destroyed his relational connectivity and his vocational creativity. As we read this story, what we see is that in his relationship with his dad, first of all, his dad was only good for his money. Dad, give it to me. Give me the money. Give me my inheritance. See, in their culture, it was basically on par with saying, Dad, just die already so I can get your stuff. And the son got his money. See, his relationship with his dad was, was one of using, using that relationship to get something out of it. Uh, he got the money, but with that money, did he honor his, his vocation to go out into the world with our resources, to love God and to, to love people, to honor God and to, to bless people? No, he spent the money on himself in vain conceit. Not for the good of other people, not for, the, uh, not for some grand and good purpose that would honor God and expand his kingdom. No, 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 no. He was living his dream in a faraway land for himself. He got the action. He got the women. He got the freedom. All that he'd ever wanted. But it left him with nothing. It left him with nothing but broken dreams and broken relationships with people who only affirmed that he was less than a pig. <laughs> well, what a picture. What a picture there. There he is with his face in the mud, longing, longing for the pig, uh, the pig pods. The food that the pigs ate. By the way, I'll just break in here to, to give a note. I have no idea what camera I'm looking at. Again, a phone taped over here. There's a computer camera over here. So please forgive me wherever you are and whichever one of these cameras is still working. I really hope they are. Um, thanks for, for, for hanging in there. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to give that little public service announcement there. This guy was in such bad shape. <clears throat> face in the mud, longing to eat what the pigs ate. Boy, what a, what a powerful picture of, of how desperate he was. 
uh, that, that he was hungry. <clears throat> but here's what we know. He wasn't, he wasn't only hungry in his belly. But we know, don't we? He was, he was hungry in his heart. He was hungry in his heart. What was he hungry for in his heart? He needed his father because he needed love. This was evidence that he was finally coming to his right mind when he realized, yes, he did need his father and he needed his father's love. He's coming to his right mind. And what we see next, see next we see the son's shame collide together with the father's love. And the son's shame was no match for the father's love. He did indeed prepare his shame speech, his shame speech. He headed home. He knew he was vulnerable to rejection. He knew he was vulnerable uh, to attacks from his old friends and his family, expecting his old friends and family and his father to pile on all of their disappointment. But before he could even get back to town, his dad had been watching and his dad did what no dignified patriarch would ever do. He ran out to his son. He, he cut his son's shame speech so, short, interrupted him, kissed him, commanded that the best robe, that is his own robe, be brought to him, that a ring, that is his own family signet ring, be brought to him, and that a party be had to celebrate his son, who was dead and now alive, this celebration that would cost a lot of money. <laughs> Now remember the setting. We've, we've, we, we must remember the setting here, okay? We, we have to remember that, that Jesus is telling the story to the Pharisees who asked the question, why do sinners keep going to Jesus? And Jesus, how can you enjoy dinner with people who are godless, who aren't righteous, who don't do the right stuff, who don't know their Bible? They don't, they don't belong to Abraham. At least they don't show it. Jesus, how can you enjoy these people? Remember, that's the context. These are the, this is the crowd listening to this story. You're hearing Jesus' answer here. He's saying, well, I'll answer your question by telling you this. The reason they come to me and they love to draw near to me is because they're hungry. They're hungry for love. You see, it's these people who keep coming to me who, are, who have finally come to their right, their right mind. They're the ones who have come to the right mind, not you Pharisees. And they've found that their shame is no match for my love. And so these sinners who are eating with Jesus, they finally found life. You know, I wonder how many of, of these sinners, so called by the Pharisees, these unrighteous uh, outsiders. I wonder how many of these sinners sitting around uh, the table were later on members of one of the early churches after Jesus had gone to the cross and was raised from the dead and ascended to his throne. I wonder, once those churches were planted, how many of these literal, literally, these people sitting around the table, I wonder how many were, were part of those churches. <laughs> Small group leaders. Sunday school teachers, preachers, elders, deacons, faithful members. Um, on Sunday mornings, as they gathered together, singing those, those early hymns about the cross, I wonder how many were there doing that. I wonder how many of these people around the table later on remembered back to these dinners where they were criticized by the Pharisees, these dinners with Jesus. And by the way, that reminds me of, of uh, you guys, because it seems so long ago when we were together. And I do think back and, and I do remember those meals of communion that we've had together, being close to you and looking you in the face and I remember those. It, it seems like so long ago. In fact, last week when we worshiped together with Mayflower, uh, how special it was to see some of your actual faces. That was wonderful. Um, and we'll be together soon to see each other again. But, but think about these people that were sitting around Jesus at this table later on who were part of the church. 
when they remembered back, when they remembered back these to these dinners, um, I wonder if they couldn't help to think. Jesus loved us so much, but we had we, we still had no idea. We felt so loved by him. There's something unique about the way he treated us, the, the, the way that he looked us, at us. There, there was such a love, and we felt it, but we still had no idea how much he loved us. We had no idea until he went to the cross. Until he went to the cross and, and took away all of our sins so that we could have an eternal relationship with God and eat with him forever. Do you remember the words from the book of 1 John where we're told there, there is no, there's no fear in love because perfect love drives out fear? We're told that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live, that this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Yeah, I bet these sinners who were gathered with Jesus around these, these tables being criticized by the Pharisees down the road after the cross, they thought back and, and realized we had no idea how much he loved us. And you know what? This is the gospel. This is the good news we talk about. And it's, it's not just for those who ate with him in person that we see here in Luke 15, but it's for you and it's for me. God loves you, not because you loved him or performed for him or or because you had the perfect shame speech, but it's because his son loved you. His son performed and worked for you. Jesus was the propitiation for your sin and shame. That is, left to myself and left to yourself, we are covered in shame. You're not worthy of God's love. Something's not right, and we deserve his judgment. In this sense, Satan is right when he accuses us and says, you're not worthy. You know what? He gets the first part of the story true. He's actually right about that, but he doesn't give us the rest of the news. And the rest of the news is the good news that says, for reasons we can't grasp, God loved us by causing Jesus, his son, to become shame in our place. You see, Jesus, his son, took the status that used to be our status of unworthy. Jesus took that status of being unworthy so that we could really be worthy before God, that we really could be his children, not in some fictional kind of way, but in a real way promised to us and signified to us and sealed for us by God himself. We're his. We are his. You see, we get the robe, we get the ring, we get the kiss. Not because, not because we had a good speech. <laughs> not because we came up with a great speech like this son on his way back from the pigs came up with. By the way, what, what is your go-to shame speech to God? What's your go-to speech when you're trying your hardest? Knowing you failed, knowing you're not enough, coming back to God, trying to convince him that you're, you're going to go to work. You'll work like one of those hired hands. What's that look like for you? God cuts you short with the gospel. He cuts it off. He interrupts you. He says, drop your shame speech. You see, my, my son had the only speech, the only speech that will ever work. And that speech is the speech in which Jesus cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me. That was the only speech that will work. And that's the only speech that causes God to really love you, that Jesus went there in our place. You know, I've wondered, <clears throat> I've wondered this week a lot. If I, if I were really overwhelmed by that love, the reality of that love for me, and that that's who I am. And if that love, as the scriptures say, it will, if it really drove out all of my fear, and if it drove away my shame, um, or maybe another way to think about it, if that's hard for you to think about, think about, put yourself in, in, in the moment where you can remember the most unloved you've ever felt, the most rejected you have ever felt. Do you remember what that 
felt like. That rejection, that shame, that, that um, unlovableness, if I can use that word. Well, put that in reverse. Put that in reverse. <laughs> and God's immeasurable love overwhelming your heart, driving away that fear and that shame. What would it look like for me personally? What would it look like if I had that uh, to not live in the fear of failure? What would that look like to not live with the, the fear of failure because of my standing with God and his love for me and how secure I am with him and his, his favor with me? What would it look like? What would it look like uh, to not live in fear of criticism or, or worrying how, how I compare to, to others <laughs> or, or what they say or how they measure me? What would it look like to, to really be connected with people because I'm not afraid to let them know who I really am and I really want to know who they are out of a heart of love and I really want to serve and, and bless them. What would that look like? What would it look like if, if I was so overwhelmed with the Father's love shown in the gospel of his son. If I were boldly creative, more bold and more creative with the gifts and the passions that God gave to me to, to love people, to love them well, and, and to serve people, to serve them well, and to serve the world for his reputation, not mine, no, but, but for his reputation. You know what it would look like? It would look like a new life. It would be new life. It would be a transformed life. It would be a new kind of humility. Oh, I have, I have so far to go. I have so far to go. And my heart of humility. But it would look like a new kind of humility, a new kind of boldness, a, a new way of generosity. Oh, I have such a long way to go, but... But oh, being overwhelmed by this love would, would, would mean a, a new kind of generosity I've never known, a, a new kind of compassion, a, a real and genuine joy. You know, I, the truth is, I want to be a husband like that who is so overwhelmed with the love of God seen in the gospel that it, it truly, as the scriptures say, drives out my fear and my shame. You know, I want to be a husband like that. I really do. I want to be a friend like that. I want to be a dad like that. Don't you? Don't you be a person so overwhelmed? You know, the truth is the world needs engineers like that. The world needs artists like that. The world needs teachers and butchers and bakers and candlestick makers like that. The world needs wives and husbands like that. Your husband needs a wife like that. Why? And, and your wife needs a, a husband like that. Your kids need a parent like that. Your friends need a friend like that. You know, people with this color of skin need those people with that color of skin to be so overwhelmed with the love of God seen in the gospel that it would drive out fear and shame and lead to deep and loving connectedness and love. And that people over there with that shade and color of skin need these people to be so overwhelmed with that same love. Yes, the world, the world needs this. What would it look like? What would it look like uh, for, for us corporately at New City? If New City grew to be filled more and more with, with that kind of love that drove out fear and shame. I mean, what would that look like for our relationships? Really, if it very practically changed the words that came out of our mouths to one another if it caused us to be more active in each other's lives in the most loving way, serving and caring for one another, if it led us to have a genuine concern and, and sympathy and heart for those outside of the church who don't know the love of God found in the gospel and a real heart for them to know it. You know, um, if New City grew to be more, to be filled more and more with, with that kind of love that drove out our fear and our shame, well, I think that would be good. I think that would be good for Detroit 
and for Ferndale and for Royal Oak and for Wayne and Oakland County. And, and you know, I think, I think Wayne County and Oakland County and Detroit and all the places where we live, I think it needs a church like that. I think it needs lots of churches like that. Yes, yes, an imperfect church. Yes, uh, our church will always have some problems but through our worship and the means of grace and our small groups and our fellowship and our teaching and our preaching, the reality and the truth of the love of God that drives out fear and shame. Um, you see, that would be a new kind of life for us. And for this to happen, we need a deep recognition of the ways in which we have listened to lies rather than the truth. We need, the, we need a deep and honest recognition of the ways we have heard and listened to pseudo-gospels, that we've looked for pseudo-loves, the way that shame has, has led us to be self-concerned instead of concerned for each other, self-trusting instead of trusting in Jesus Christ. We need an honest and deep recognition, and we need an honest and deep repentance, turning away from these things, the self-concern, the self-trust driven by shame, and turning instead to our only Savior, that's what we need to do this continually, just as the people at this dinner party continually drew near to Jesus. Well, that's our answer too, to continually draw near to him in the gospel, the truth of the gospel, thinking about it so that it will pour deep into our hearts and pour out through our pores into our relationships, our church, our city. And you know what will happen and what we'll see? The love of God in us will be no match for the shame that is lurking in our heart. And the love of God through us will be no match for the shame that is trying to get a hold of your kids or your marriage or the shame that's trying to get a hold of our city. Mm -mm. The love of God through us will be no match. And so through this parable, Jesus confronts us, doesn't he? He gets our attention and he paints a picture for us of some areas that we need to think deeply about repenting and changing the focus of our lives and the focus of our heart. We need to come back to the Father. The story's over, right? No, the story's not over. <laughs> you know why? All the lost have not yet been found. Oh, there's still one who is lost, and there's still one who is starving, but he doesn't know it. That is the older son, the older brother. And for this week, we're gonna stop right here, and next week, we're gonna pick up and look at the rest of this story and how Jesus says something very important to us through the life of this older brother. But for now, let's do one thing. Let's draw near to Jesus, knowing that he loved us before we could ever love him. He was watching and waiting and seeking. He came after you, not because your shame speech has ever been good enough, but only his speech from the cross and his work for you. Isn't that amazing news? Let's rejoice together, you see. Let's pray together, you see, that this will be true for us personally and individually and for us as a church. Won't that be beautiful? Amen.